Good evening, um, KAA family. Hello again. I'm back this week, but this time um, I am back with Perpetua of Dynamic Occupational Therapy. And before we continue, I always like to check my sound, make sure it's working. And I usually get a cue from my partner in crime here. <laughs> So, um, okay, so we are live and I just wanted to welcome all our new members uh, who've recently joined Kenya Autism Alliance and our platform actually is an awesome platform if I should say that. We've been trying so much during this COVID-19 to give parents free sessions on occupational therapy, different topics, just empowering parents. So today we have with us Perpetua and she'll be covering autism and feeding. So I just discovered not so long ago, there's issues with feeding and there's also issues with picky. So there's picky eaters and then there's food issues. So that's not my ex expertise. And so I will let Perpetua take it from here and um, Perpetua introduce yourself and then we can go from there. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Cindy. My name is Perpetua, uh, founder and director at Dynamic Occupational Therapy. So I would love to share a few things about autism and feeding and what you can try as parents, but I'll also start on more of us getting to understand what are actually the issues. As Cindy yeah. says, picking picky eaters, and then there's that other side. So I would uh, like to share a few slides. So we'll see, we actually get to see what 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 it entails. Okay. So we are we can all see. Um put it quick. Okay. I expanded it perpetual, so I think they should be able to see it. Awesome, awesome. So yes, yeah, so it's just a presentation on autism and feeding issues from an autist perspective. What I'd like to say is that there's a huge team that works with children with feeding issues. So OTs are part of the team. So that's why I didn't put the topic very wide. I, would nar I narrowed it down from an OTs perspective because it's a multidisciplinary approach that is taken to help children to deal with the feeding problems or the feeding challenges. Mm -hmm. So if we see that uh, food selectivity impacts quite a number of children and the percentages are quite high. So either they will be picky, they would want a particular kind of texture. Then now, this then now comes to uh, the challenges now the huge number of parents and caregivers face. Many will be stressed or frustrated by, by, by this because then how, how, do you, how do you add feeding issues to behavioral issues? to fine motor issues, to sensory issues. So it's another pile on, it's another thing on your pile. So it is something that we can, we can just try to, to, to dig deep a little bit so that you have a little bit more knowledge on the feeding challenges and how and who you can approach to be able to help you. So we find that it ranges. It ranges from picky eating, they can eat less under eating, or they can even eat more because then now they don't, feel their tummy full or they can't explain that their tummy is full so they they the feeding problems range and there's that chronic food refusal where they actually just refuse to eat and some uh then due to this there's that failure to thrive or there's obesity now obesity comes and is linked to the overeating where the child just eats eats and eats or the obesity is linked to the child all, all the, the, the food they, they accept are foods that are not in the category of healthy foods. So you can imagine if a child is only, is only limited to, uh, let's say, um, uh, McDonald's food only. That's the only food they can consume. So you can imagine the amount of calories they are taking for their body is, is too much. So that's why you'll find also obesity. So also a child who presents with Nutritional deficit is at risk of delays, and this delay can be physical or cognitive. And then in addition to already the challenges in behavior, so nutritional deficit increases or uh, brings about behavioral changes. So you find that the child is more irritable, they are, they are maybe more fatigued, and then now already adding to the sleep difficulties children in the spectrum already have. So when they have nutritional deficits, then they will have sleep deficits sleep difficulties. 
So you find that it is important that we are able to, to actually keep tabs and keep track of children and, the, and, and what they are eating and what, what is it that can be done. So the feeding disorders can, can manifest in different ways. So it can be food, food refusal where they refuse a particular kind of food or they are too overselective, like they will only pick a certain, a, a certain texture or a certain type of food. So if it is persistent, then now it now takes us back to the nutritional uh, inadequacies, the, the inadequate nutritional intake. So if they refuse consistently, constantly, every meal, uh, that particular food, that types of food, you'll find that now they have the nutritional deficits. And with the nutritional deficits, we now see challenges with the sleep, we see challenges with irritability. So those are the things that now come if there's a challenge with the, the inadequate nutrition. Then also disruptive behavior is also classified as a type of a feeding problem. So if a child, for example, consistently sees at a certain kind of food and has a meltdown where they're screaming, kicking, uh, uh, throwing the food down, uh, um, pouring the milk. So that one is a disruptive behavior. So it is classified as a feeding problem. So then now, if it is consistent, then it actually impedes the consumption of adequate nutrients. So you can see a child on the spectrum is having all this on their plate. So with the feeding disorder, then the behavior challenges. And then the, also we have also the, the fixation, because now if they say, I am, I am fixated on that my rice is, 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 has to be on this side, or my peas are only two, I only take three pieces of this particular vegetable. So the fixation uh, makes them also not take enough nutrients. So then also there are, there are various researches that have shown that children with autism present uh, with more behavioral problems during mealtime than other children. And this now means that their nutritional intake is not the same as the other children. So they will have fewer servings of vegetables, fewer serving of calories, fewer servings of uh, fibers and even fruits. So you find that now that limited range of what they can access then now predisposes them to um, less nutritional as compared to the other children. So uh, by and large feeding is, 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 is individualized like every child feeding development varies. So the child will be able to take uh, uh, pured food, the ones that is just pured, and then there is another one who will move very fast from that really uh, soft food to a uh, uh, semi-solid food very fast. And there's someone, there's one child who will stay. But the ones, the things that are at the core of this that will make it different is the anatomical structure used in feeding. So the mouth, the lips, how are they able to control their mouth, how are they able to control their lips. And then another thing that also comes and affects the growth and development uh, in the areas of feeding is the child's social and cognitive uh, and emotional development. So the other area is all that also affects is the, is the environmental factors. So we'll, 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 we'll look at the, 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 the medical status of the child. There are children who have uh, the, the, uh, the, gas, the, the gastric, the gastric uh, challenges. So you find that they will find it hard to keep down food. Somehow the reflux or the food comes out. You find that there are children who find it hard to close their lips or to move their tongue during chewing. And then the social and cognitive, you find that... Um, it's the social also interaction. So if the child uh, has uh, challenges with communication, has challenges with appropriate social exchange and opportunities, or uh, having challenges with being able to model and copy. So children learn, learn a lot by coping. So if the child cannot copy what we are doing, because many children just observe and do, and it follows like just normal, but for the children on the spectrum, they might have a challenge with this. The social communication skills usually have a challenge. So now this also applies in the, in the, in the mealtime. So you find that now the child might struggle to be able to say and, and link that when people sit and eat, 
uh, you take your spoon, you sit quietly, you eat, you finish your food, you take your plate to the kitchen. And for the children on the spectrum, you have to take time to walk them through this. So another thing that I would highlight is the sensory issues that now will come into play when the children have a, a feeding challenge. You'll find that they cannot tolerate a certain texture of food. So it is not that the child does not want your type of cooking. <laughs> As mothers, you may feel like maybe it is how you cook the food. <laughs> so it is not how you cooked. So it is just the texture they cannot tolerate. It is not the oil you used to cook it with. But there are some children who are very particular. They taste even the oil. They feel mm -hmm. like the oil cooked was. So I think it's not the way food is cooked. It is just the texture. So don't feel bad and say you are a bad cook. It's just that their child is finding it hard to tolerate that texture. And it's not that the child does not like you or wants to misbehave. Because it might be taken as uh, the child is misbehaving, that mm -hmm. we wait for mealtime, then you start gagging, and then you start vomiting, and then you start to scream and cry. So you you might need to balance the, 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 the how you react to the child. Do you shout at the child? Do you sometimes some beat the child? Do you yeah. do that? Mm -hmm. So you, you have to, to really think about it now as a parent and discover that. It is actually a challenge. It is not a, a, It is not the, the child that they are being naughty. Mm -hmm. It is just a challenge. So find it as a genuine challenge, not behavioral, not, let's say, not a, a, a by choice thing. So you'll find that in terms of sensory, the, the, that food texture is like, if I give you some sand to chew, how would you feel? If I gave you some sand, so I put some rice and sand, and then I tell you, eat, and then you start gagging, and I say, stop gagging, just keep on eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, so you wouldn't, you you will actually fight for your life and say, I would rather fight than eat this kind of food. Mm -hmm. So their, their senses are heightened, as in it's so hypersensitive, meaning that you can imagine sensitivity and then add hyper to sensitivity. So, for example, uh, uh, if you if you find some sound loud, that is already you are sensitive to that form of sound. And then now, if you hide, if you add hypersensitivity, it means that sound you are hearing it could be the same to the other person. They are hearing it's a bit loud, but for you it is heightened. I think there was a movie or a series called, is it Eight Senses or Sense Eight, where the person used to, to feel and hear sounds much more than others. So now let's start thought in food. So for you, the 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 let's let's pick a food that I might find that the children on the spectrum might find it hard. Yes, let's put soup and a bit of potatoes in the soup or a bit of pumpkin. So you have a running texture, and then you have something bumpy. So for that child, they will feel the running texture, but when it comes to the bumpy, it is like, it is too hypersensitive. The child is very hypersensitive. They start wanting to gag. If you give the soup by itself, putting just the soup by itself, they will take the soup and swallow it nicely. But them combining the soup and a soft thing, they, they, they might struggle. So it varies with children. There are children who will struggle now moving from... Uh, mashed food or pure food so they will struggle from moving from a soft a really fluid kind of textured food to a food with bumps i think i used to see some children even with yogurt you see that they thought that yogurt that have some little bit of fruits in it mm -hmm. the children who used to feel it and they start gagging and you're like this fruit is so small like the the passion fruit you'd find the children even gagging with the yogurt that used to have the passion fruit in it there's one little girl we used to work with that had a challenge with, she couldn't even stand the look of the food. If she can't eat bread, she can't stand seeing someone else eating that bread. <laughs> so imagine in, 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 a, in, a, in a school setup where they're supposed to eat lunch together, she actually used to sit in a different table mm -hmm. away from the other children because she cannot stand even the sight. She carried her packed lunch for some time. But she couldn't stand the sight of the other smell of that other food. So apart from the taste, I think also parents need to consider the smell 
Mm-hmm. And then there are those children who see some food and they start gagging. And they haven't even eaten it. Right. <laughs> so we, we yeah, we need to consider that not only the taste, they also the look, even just seeing it. So you need also to get and say as a parent as or as a caregiver, my child at least can stand the look of this food. At least my child can stand the smell. And if they cannot, then you have to keep it away. And we now see the how. So the how is coming, but consider all that. So there are children who are extremely overselective. So when they're overselective, then now it brings us back to the point that they will have nutritional inadequacies. So how do we as caregivers facilitate either a positive or a negative feeding environment? Because remember, yeah. we say what, what helps with the development in feeding? It is one, the anatomical structure, how the, the, how the mouth is, how far, how the, the, the movement is. And uh, we also said about the, 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 the sensory, you find that now you'll have sensory, some have medical challenges. The other thing we said was environment. We said also social, cognitive, developmental stages and how where they are. And then now we are at the, the environment. So as caregivers, we are part of the environment. So are we creating a positive or a negative feeding environment? So how do we do it? So by either providing an irregular or a regular feeding environment. Mm-hmm. What do we mean? Is the feeding time consistent? Do we eat breakfast at eight today? We, it doesn't have to be rigid, but is it consistent and regular? Does the child know we are eating food at eight? We are eating food at nine, or today it is seven, tomorrow it is nine. It is how mommy wakes up and feels like eating. So it is. It is. Is it? Is it consistent? Is it regular? And then, what are the consequences? Are the consequences consistent? Today it is a shout. Tomorrow. Moro is a uh, uh, um, <laughs> tomorrow's I'll take your food away. <laughs> so are, are we having consistent or inconsistent consequences for appropriate and inappropriate behavior during feeding? Why do I say appropriate? It is important to to reward and celebrate your child when they actually do the right thing during eating, and not only eating in all aspects. So you just need to celebrate and reward your child. If they, they are doing something during eating, they have tried a food texture, even if it's a small leak, they have leaked something that they would have never placed in their mouth. Do we cheer and say, yeah, good job. You'll get something. You'll get a sticker. Awesome job. You'll get this for dessert. Are we, are we, are we also being consistent with appropriate, uh, 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 or, or encouraging appropriate behaviors? And how do we deal with inappropriate behaviors? The child just knocks the cup over and pours the milk. Then what? So try and picture that in your mind as a parent or a caregiver. Is it consistent? So it is It is just also helping you to reflect on also what are the contributors to the feeding problems? Because you find that, yes, the child has already a feeding problem, but there's something that will either pour fuel or cool down the fire. So let's just reflect and see, as a caregiver, how is my feeding environment? What are my consequences? Have you even thought about consequences during mealtime? Because I know sometimes if we don't think about it, we find that now when it happens, we we either overreact or we don't react. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So you have to already plan it in your mind that when this happens, this is what you are going to do. And also discuss it with the child. Apart from mealtime, away from the table, take it as a discussion you'll have with your child. Uh, These are the appropriate. Show them the appropriate. We have lots of pictures, lots of social stories you can use. Show them the appropriate. And then now tell them if the appropriate happens, show them the rewards they will get. You can even have a sticker chat really close to you during mealtime. So immediately after mealtime, if they have done well, they put a sticker on their sticker chart at home. And then now share with them if there's, uh, there's the inappropriate behavior, this is what we are going to do. So those are some of the considerations I would like to just challenge you to, to, to consider. So when it now comes to a comprehensive feeding assessment, there are various things that now that will be checked. 
to be able to 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 gauge that 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 the, the challenges the child will have. We find that medical history is important to be taken. That and it will be able to check their oral motor skills, how they're able to move their mouth, their lip, their tongue movement, how they're able to chew, what is the strength of the muscles around the mouth. So you find that there are children who find it hard to chew because their strength, their muscle tone is low. So mm -hmm. they now need strengthening activities to be able to help with their muscle tone. So then now another thing medically they need to check is their current weight, their height, uh, their strength, their calorie intake. Are they are they taking enough and adequate nutrition for the age? Because remember now it is age based and every child is different and at different stages, so it has to be checked. Then the, the interviews will be conducted, so clinical interviews with caregivers. So then now people here that the medical professionals now come to follow up with how is the feeding, how is it? They do a like a a, a chat a whole week. The parent writes down what the child is able to eat for that one week. What were they able to eat? What were they able not to eat? What was introduced? What was what was what was rejected? <laughs> it is actually like you you are doing a, a like a mini research in a way on what your child eats. <laughs> so it's like a food log. Yes, yes, you actually take a log. So then now you, you that now gives the clinicians working with you a perspective of. Where are where is currently the, what is what where is the child currently? Are they taking soft foods? Are, are they experimenting with semi so, semi solid food? Where are they? So then now it requires the parent to actually now know what the child is able to eat. So then now another thing is that now when the, all that is done, then now the the practitioners come up with a strategy. But before the strategy, there's something also the practitioners still look into. So where is the where does the child sit? Where do they sit during eating? Is it on the sofa set where there's freedom of movement, where they can eat and watch TV at the same time? <laughs> are they distracted during eating? What activities are going on in the house during eating? Is the TV on during eating? So it creates distraction. Uh, do the children eat alone or they eat with caregivers? So those are also dynamics now people look into. And then we also look into independence. Are they eating by themselves or do they depend on their caregiver for feeding? So now this gives dynamics of uh, are they experimenting or are they given time to try the texture or is it feed quickly and need to do something? <laughs> so... We also get to get those perspectives. And then also, if they're independent in eating, what 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 do they use for eating? Do they prefer eating with their hands? Do they prefer eating with a spoon? Uh, are there those who just want a spoon and a fork? As in, so we, we need to know what feeding utensils they, they also can be able to use. Mm -hmm. Then we also, find that we also look at what, what drinking format are they comfortable with? Are they taking from a bottle? Are they taking from a sippy cup? Are they able to take from a straw? Or are they, are they able to take from a cup? So then now we know if we, we are doing anything in regards to drinking, which which is the current level they are in. So some can still be at the uh, at the bottle feeding, the, the feeding bottles with the, with the, with the, with the nip, nipple. So you find that now, you find that those who are still at that stage, yet, if you look at their age, they are, should be well and beyond above that, but they are still at this stage. So then now as practitioners, we're able to know this child is currently here. Now we are working towards them moving to either a sippy cup or an open cup or to a straw. So it is important we look at those dynamics. So when we look at feeding, then you see now there, there are different feeding challenges. And there are those now because of a child being in the spectrum, there are now those that are now they, they, they might have. So what I'd like also to mention is there's, there's also some research that now, now shows that or has been there that shows that there are some children who in the spectrum will have a challenge with breaking down of enzymes, enzymes found in in uh, breaking down of foods, food for the food, like food, like wheat, uh, things like um, milk, gluten, like breaking down gluten or any gluten that anything found in oats oats wheat and things like that and some find it hard to break down um, 
the milk, like breaking it down. So you find that they lack those enzymes. So when they lack those enzymes, then it means the child might even not have interest in those foods because they already have challenges with digesting it and things like that. But also now the nutritional challenges that now comes if they miss that. So it's some consideration that we may also need to have. Is the child having a challenge with the breaking down of? Of, of the foods that when it is now in, in, in small forms, in enzyme, can they, can, do they have the enzymes to, to break it down? So there are those who are okay, who they don't have that challenge, but there are those who actually now have the challenge. So it is good to just take note to see if they have that challenge or not. So then another thing we also need to look at, as we are saying the food log, is what food texture can they tolerate? So then now this this is where also where the OTs come in handy because I re remember you said I, the, the team that now works with the feeding problem is a multidisciplinary team. So it's a team made out of different people. So then now the OT is, is, is good in this at the area of the food textures because they, they now do something called a, a sensory check. So they check a sensory assessment. So they're able to check and see what, what, what are the food preferences they might have in terms of sensory. What is their body... Uh, hypersensitive to so now the OT is able to give in that dynamic so uh, so what what food post what food, what food textures are are they are they able to tolerate so is it liquid is it uh, pure baby food is it stage three baby food is it creamy food is it mashed is it chopped up food so it goes on increasing until they get to chewy food or crunchy food and then what is the oral motor concern so are they able to move their tongue well? Are they able to close their mouth well when they're eating? Are they, are they drooling? Is they drooling? Are, are they coughing during eating? Are they gagging? Are they putting too much food? There are those who vomit the food. Are they holding the food in the mouth for too long? Um, so it's just those things that we might need to consider when, when, we are, when we are feeding them. So as I said, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So for it to be a hundred percent effective, uh, it is important to involve a few, uh, if you can, all, but if you cannot, a few of these. So the team consists of occupational therapists. We have the board certifies behavior analyst, the nutritionist, the speech therapist, and the pediatric uh, gastro gastroenterologist that's a long one so <laughs> gastroenterologist <laughs> that was really awesome so <laughs> so it's a huge team but yeah. i think if we if we if we now understand that it's a it's a it's a huge team then it means that now when we when we actually identify a feeding problem you have a list of professionals you can approach and a, a list of professional professionals who are are close to you because you might find currently you are working with an occupational therapist or you're working with a, 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 a board certified uh, analyst, behavior analyst, or you are close to a nutritionist. So consult with the with the team member that is close to you. Consult with the team member that is close to you. So uh, the, with the intervention, I can now speak from an, from an OT's perspective because we see now it's an entire team. So from an OT perspective, I would say that uh, if you can try thicken the, 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 the puree. So if it was really running, try and increase the, the, the thickening of the, the puree. Add, add something that will make it a little bit heavier. So you can either add some, add cornstarch <laughs> to make it a little bit heavier. Some they might might uh, mash in maybe some potatoes, some potatoes. So it depends on what you'll pick that will be able to thicken the puree. Another thing you can try is uh, try various soft foods. You can try soft cheese. You can try scrambled eggs. You can try uh, soft fruits such as bananas. So it is just trying what are the soft foods that your child can tolerate or you can teach them to tolerate. Another thing that is, is an interesting one is that you can model <laughs> how to bite small pieces from a hole. Mm -hmm. So it sounds funny, but 
you, you, you actually like take a bite from an apple and then you show them like this is how you bite. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you actually like you show them so they have to see oh so and the children in the spectrum are so awesome with their visual skills. So if we just use the, 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 the best way they use to learn, even with the feeding and training how to feed, it can be awesome. So you just bite and show, and it might even be, you can give them a small piece they try. So that one helps with the biting, training in biting. Uh, another thing that works with training in biting is the, is the biting of like crunchy food. Because when you bite, you know, it produces that crunchy sound. Mm -hmm. So then it is a, it's, a, it's one that you can use to, to help the child try and learn how to bite. Because there is that incentive of that crunchy sound. So it's you can so teach direct. biting with that. Because you see, biting is, is, a, is a... It's got sound effects. <laughs> yes, in I'm saying it's got sound effects, the crunchy food. Yes, the sound effects. Yes, so that that sound effect, the children, some children get fancied by it because, like, oh, it's me who made that sound. They bite again. They hear it. So it's a nice thing that if they can practice with the biting like that, and then also another thing is to model how to chew with <laughs> with your mouth open. It's not the best etiquette, but it's just that you are showing them how you move your your, your jaw. <laughs> yeah. So, so someone was saying you really exaggerate it. So then they say, oh, so that's how you move your mouth when you eat. <laughs> but by and large, you just have to show it and then just keep on practicing. And then also you can you can try a bit when they when they see that they're tolerating a bit of the foods and they're starting to try to chew. So you can try introduce chewy food like dried mangoes, a little bit of beef. So things that are chewy, things that takes a bit of time to chew. So even chewy food that is crunchy then adds to the list. There are those who would say you can try crisps, you can try anything that is crunchy. Another thing, if the child is having too much drooling, you can do blowing activities. You see like blowing candles, blowing uh, pieces of paper, blowing um, um, cotton balls, uh, uh, Bubble, so you can create various games. You can say, Let's create a tornado. So they, they blow if they can blow quite well, it can create a, a, a big tornado, it pushes all the papers away. So you can create various games and activities that can be able to help with that. So blowing helps the, the muscle control and the, the drooling, so that now it reduces the drooling and more of the control of the mouth muscles. Then it is encouraged that if you can eat together as a family. So then now they're able, you're able to model that this is how people eat, this is what you do, and things like that. When, where possible, take time to eat together as a family. And also I would say encourage self-feeding. Uh, encourage the child to self-feed, even if it's just the first two spoons or the first three, because you say, okay, if I let him feed, we're going to stay here for one hour. What you can do is just encourage the first few spoons or the first middle or the, the spoons in between the feeding or the last few spoons. So I would also encourage for gradual exposure, but don't force. Because I know there's that there's that temptation of let them eat quickly so that we finish with this story. Or maybe if I force, they'll get used to it in whatever one way or another. So forcing creates a bad, a bad, a bad feeling towards food. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage don't force. And if oh, you, if yeah. it's a, yeah, it's got yeah. PTSD effects. <laughs> yes, yes. So then don't don't force because once you force, the, it's a routine. They know food time is fight time because imagine routine is is quite key for children on the spectrum. So if they form it as a routine, food time is fight time then you'll have very hard meal time. So don't force, just try to gradually expose them to the food textures. If they refuse, it's okay. Just find ways to give them food. But if the child is having a challenge of eating completely, then now seek medical advice, go to, to the pediatrician, uh, find out what, what, what else can we do to substitute the nutrients. Can they have the nutrient bars? Can they have what? What can the the, 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 the pediatrician and the develop and and the nutritionist be able to work out for this child not to miss on nutrients? 
So are they having are they having the nutritional intake they need? Can they take snack bars? Can they take what can they take? There are many, various many as very very many products and companies that do do many things in nutrients that are they, that are nice to eat and or drink. Because <laughs> you find that there are those nutri nutri shakes. So mm -hmm. you've taken a whole nutrient, or you've taken lots of nutrients, but in a very nice tasting way. Mm -hmm. So I think parents need also to consider such such options for their children not to miss out on nutrients. Because as we see, when they have nutritional deficits, it adds on many things like sleep deficits. It mm -hmm. adds on irritability. It makes them get tired. So they drag themselves throughout the day. So it, it actually affects them. So yeah. try find yeah. other options. I think if you find that now they can't tolerate this food completely, completely, let's say milk, if they can't tolerate milk, mm -hmm. what option are you giving them for calcium? What options do you have? So look for them and, and give them. Are you giving them a piece of cheese? Are they taking yogurt for replacement of milk? So if they can't take dairy, because maybe because of the... the the enzymes that are missing to break down those uh, those the, the food. What, what what other option can they get? So that's where the nutritionist nutritionist comes into play. That they will be able to guide you on the options, and then now you create another list of options, and then you start ticking off or putting down what they can be able to take. So also encourage uh, uh, your child to explore. Creating and making food together now exposes the child to text, touch, and, and smell. Because remember, those, as, as I said, there are children who can't even touch it. They can't even, they can't stand the smell of that food. So then now when you make food together, then it gives them the opportunity, even if it's just that, please hand me that bread. <laughs> so the fact that they have just touched it briefly and given it to you, you have given them a small uh Exposition to the food. So you've made them explore and see the food. Or if you sell them, please help me um, put the things together and things like this together. So you, you help them to be able to, to, to explore and touch the food. Then also then uh, help them to, um, if you can, set a meal time. If you can, stick to it. Because then now consistency now helps you to be able to work, also work on many things. So when you're consistent with your, your meal times, it is important that it will be able to encourage that positive behavior or the positive, positive environment. Then also, if the child has a challenge with mouth movement, uh, kindly place it on the right or the left corner of the mouth. Or if they have challenges with the tongue movement, you place it on either sides of the, if you're feeding them, if they're not being, uh, they're, they can't feed themselves, if you're feeding them, you place the food on either sides of the corners of the mouth. So then now that will encourage them to put their tongue to get the food out of the corner. So those are some of the techniques you can use to be able to help the food move, help the child move the food. So then also when they have a structured therapy program that meets their sensory needs, this also comes into play also with the with the feeding. So if the sensory needs are being met in one way or another, then it helps with the feeding. Then apart from all those strategies and tips, it is important that parents require and, and, and get education that will consist of about nutrients, nutritional uh, intake, what is adequate, what is inadequate, what do the children need at this age? At this age where they're having a big growth spurt, what nutrients do they need more? What, what nutrients can they get more? What are the options you have for the nutrients? Another thing is that you, the parents will need uh, guidance in meal structures. So if, if you find that they have limited uh, variety, how can you structure or change that particular food they, they eat and, and, and put it up in three or four different ways. And how do you structure it in your meals throughout the week? So you find that there are meal structures that go for two weeks, one week, three weeks. So it's per also how the child is able to, to tolerate. And then how to increase the variety of the child's diet. Because if, if the child is currently accepting only uh, pureed food, 
you find that now when you introduce uh, semi-solid foods, then it's a slow gradual process. But if they are taking that really soft food and then you go straight to chewy food, then now you remove the, 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 the psych they had to learn. So it has to be very gradual that you just introduce the texture slowly. I know there are some situations where the child is old and you feel like my child is old, he's maybe seven years and he's still eating mashed foods. It might be tempting to rush the process to move from mashed and then what the next day you try something very chewy. So I would recommend for parents that don't rush the process, just let them go step by step. Because once they move from one stage to the next one, we are sure now they are done with that other stage. So it is nice to just take, take slowly, take time to just introduce the variety. So then now real-time coaching with the children and the parent during the feeding intervention is required. Because you find that now week one is good and then week two is disaster. So at least you need someone to walk with you. Then when you hit a, a bump, then they just tell you, no, no, no. Uh, we, we've noticed you did this and this and this. So try this this week. So that coaching is important. And you find there are programs that do like parent support groups. And then they, they have like 16 weeks program where they, they have different activities throughout. So you find that that kind of coaching is, is quite integral. So by and large, if I can summarize the feeding, uh, the feeding issues and what we might we, we, we need to consider as parents, I would, I would put it up as that. That is what I would highlight to you as parents. But as I said, it is quite a multidisciplinary thing. So it is quite, you find that we, we need to work as, as, as a team to be able to, to, to be able to help the children uh, develop. But the beautiful thing is that they, 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 they develop. It's just that the how. Make them like food. Make them want to eat food. Let them not feel food is a punishment. Because you can imagine if you are forced to eat, you will feel like it's, it's actually a punishment. You will feel like uh, I am eating just to eat or I have to eat just to finish this food. So show them also videos of why it is important to eat the right foods. So you know, there are very many things like it makes you strong. So they see videos of someone growing strong. And then when someone eats the wrong food, they grow a different form of way. But by and large, that's it. <laughs> that's awesome. Can you can you still hear me? Perpetua. Can you hear me? I think I lost her. Perpetua, can you hear me? Yeah, so good, Cindy. Back to you. So oh. if there's any questions, if there's any uh, thing highlighted by parents. Um, yeah, so thank it. you. Yeah, who knew feeding issues could be such a domino effect on behavior? um sensory fields um sleeping for sure obviously if you if you're hungry then obviously going to bed hungry is one of the issues obviously and then obviously if you're lacking some type of nutrient uh you end up seeing some kids i know we had an experience where kyle was iron deficient and he was trying to eat rocks he was trying to eat paper he was trying to eat all these things that were non-food so feeding issues, dietary issues. I yes, had a question for yes you. I can hear you. Yeah, so I had a question. You had like the multidisciplinary people involved. Do you also include a dietitian? I think I lost Perpetua. <laughs> no. Yeah. So um, I see a question. Uh, somebody had a question about how do you train and self like a self-feeding, self-feeding with a spoon and a fork. So once Perpetua comes back, she'll be able to tell us um, how you can self-train your child to um, eat with a spoon or a fork and actually even use a knife. So for us, for me, I would say some kids prefer eating with their hands, which is actually not a bad thing. Um, make sure they wash their hands, obviously, and teaching them how to use a spoon, um, you can also do like a mimic 
type thing, let them copy you as Perpetua had mentioned. And in addition to that, um, I'm glad you guys are really actually learning because I'm also learning a few things that I didn't know, even if my child is older, the ones who have little kids, it's, it's, this is a very informative, educative um, uh, video. It's going to be saved on KAA and you guys can always reference it. And uh, I think we dropped Perpetua, but does anybody else have any questions? But now you can see how feeding affects sleep. Feeding affects behavior. So if you're constantly feeding your kids sugar, then obviously they'll be very hyper, right? So it's like a domino effect that will affect your kid from feeding and sleeping and actually sticking to tasks because of their food issues. I know we are very reactive um, culture where when your child doesn't want to eat spinach and all these other fruits and veggies, uh, we are always quick to jump, get a slipper and, you know, spank the kids. But let's not do that according I to know Perpetua. Spanky kids. Yes. So even Kyle said he knows about that. So let's refrain from just jumping the gun and instilling fear in feeding. Let's not make our kids despise food. So I know growing up, uh, yeah, that was the order of the day. So I particularly didn't like carrots. So yeah, parenting, we are reactive. We like to spank. We like to make our kids, force our kids to eat certain foods. So then you find that when the kids get older, um, they dislike um, carrots. So for me, <laughs> now I do not like carrots because it's traumatic, okay? So to be honest with you, I don't like carrots and it's from past history. Uh, do I eat it? Sometimes I do, but it's a remembrance of being forced to eat carrots. So Perpetua is back. Perpetua, can you hear me? Oh, she's on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, she's on. Yeah, so anyway, Perpetua is back with us once her computer syncs with mine, then um, she can hear me. So Perpetua, tell me if you can hear me. We had a question from a parent. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? A parent who asked about how do you train self-feeding with a spoon and a fork? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Sorry for that. <laughs> How do you train um, self-feeding with a spoon or a fork? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're kind of delayed, but I can hear you. I can hear you. Awesome. I'm going to do that. So, yes, yes, uh, I can hear you. Okay, I think our microphones are delayed. Uh, your your mini is delayed. But did you hear my question about self feeding with a fork and a spoon? Okay, I think it's delayed. Okay, so uh, you can start with with game. Like for example, you can help them just uh, you can you can you can you see the way you roll the dough for chapati. So you roll it up into one long one long thin line, and then you you just let them cut. You teach them how to cut. So at times you start it in a non-food way, and then now you move to food. Yes. So a spoon and a fork. So I would go for, yes, yes. So a spoon and a fork, I would find that with, with a spoon. Oh, okay. So Perpetua dropped again. So we're having some network issues. So um, I'll let her continue. Maybe she'll answer you guys on the comment section. So at least for now, this is where we're at. And let's see if there's any other questions. Um, I don't see any other questions. 
Yeah, you guys are welcome. And I'm sure we'll do another part two um, if you guys have additional questions. But for now, I hope this was very informative. Just really don't be reactive with your kids. Take time, sit down, sit with your kids, eat dinner with them, eat lunch, breakfast. Um, something I wanted to bring up, sometimes for dinner we eat breakfast. So that's just my household. We swap around. Some days we'll have pancake for dinner and it's not a big deal. So um, yeah, try and sit and eat with your kids and also um, create a dining table or a specific place consistently. Pick a consistent time. If dinner is seven, is at seven, make it seven every day. Of course, there are sometimes we are very busy. We'll switch it up to eight or try not to eat too late. But, you know, I can't say that. There's a time I ate cereal at two in the morning. So, but anyway, this is for our kids. So try and be consistent location where you eat. Eat with your families as much as you can. I know sometimes it's tricky. You come from work late, but try and be very consistent with your kids. Have them copy you. Um, let me tell you, those visuals really help. Be Stand side by side with your child. Let them mimic what you're doing. It really, really helps a lot. So, and this will help boost your child's cognitive and all. But let me tell you something. When it comes to dietary issues, nutrition, and nutrition, please consult the doctors. Don't try and copy everyone on KEA who is saying, oh, my kid doesn't eat wheat, so don't just remove wheat. Again, it back, it's, goes back to diet. Let's consult the real experts as far as the child and their development. So call your doctor, find out why your child is, that, like the, your child's nutrition, check with your doctors, don't copy paste. I always say that and I'll say it all the time, do not copy paste. You could actually harm your kid. So I'm trying to see what else she said. I know Perpetual, we lost you, but it's okay. You've told us so much, you've taught us so much and I really, really thank you. And I'm sure parents will be asking again. <laughs> Perpetua is back. Let me see if I can add her back. Um, give me one second. Okay. Perpetua, I see you're back with me again. <laughs> Let's see if she can hear me. And if not, guys, honestly, she can answer your questions on, on Facebook. I know our network is a little delayed here, there, but hey, it's not a surprise. Sometimes you have perfect network, sometimes you just won't. So Perpetua, I am going to see if you can hear me once again. And if not, we'll have to um, bring you back again. Can you hear? Yeah, I'm having challenges with the internet. I don't know what has happened. It's okay. I did a quick summary of what, what you said. I hope I did a good job. But we can always just come back. Uh, Perpetua, we can always just come back. So thanks, guys. I know Perpetua is having some trouble. So, but I thank you. Please post all kinds of questions that you have and she'll be able to answer you guys. And actually have a wonderful evening. I know it's really late, but we thank you so much. And please continue spending time with your kids, keep them safe. Um, and again, don't- Yes, I can hear, can you hear me? Yes. So don't force your kids to eat certain foods. Again, um, perpetually, we're having trouble. But guys, we'll be back um, as soon as Perpetua and I recalibrate this whole thing. Thank you so much.